Chapter six of the Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirk Hendrick, Trinity, Florida. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter six. Part one. Modern Artillery, Rifles, Machine Guns. Modern Artillery. The vast subject of artillery in its modern form include under this head, for convenience sake, not only heavy ordnance, but machine guns and small arms, can of necessity only be dealt with most briefly in this chapter. It may therefore well be to take a general survey and to define beforehand any words or phrases which are used technically in describing the various operations. The employment of firearms dates from a long distance past, and it is interesting to note that many improvement introduced during the last century is but a revival of former invention which only lack accuracy in tools and appliances and hitherto prevented from being brought into practical usage so far back as fourteen ninety eight the art of rifling cannon in straight grooves was known and a british patent was taken out in sixteen thirty five by rotsapan the grooves were first made spiral or screwed by coster of birmingham about sixteen twenty Berlin possesses a rifled cannon with 13 grooves dated 1664, but the first recorded uses of such weapons in actual warfare was during Louis Napoleon's Italian campaign in 1859, and two years later by General James of the United States Army. The system of breech-loading, again, is as old as the 16th century, and we find a British patent of 1741, while the first United States patent was given in 1811 for a flint-lock weapon magazine guns of american production appeared in eighteen forty nine and eighteen sixty but these were really an adaptation of the old matchlock revolvers said to belong to the period of fourteen eighty to fifteen hundred there is one in the tower of london credited to the fifteenth century and a british patent of seventeen eighteen describes a well-constructed revolver carried on a tripod and of the dimensions of a modern machine gun the inventor gravely explains that he has provided round chambers for round bullets to shoot christians and square chambers with square missiles for use against the turks the word ordnance is applied to heavy guns of all kinds and includes guns mounted on fortresses naval guns siege artillery and that for use in the field these guns are all mounted on stands or carriages and may be divided into three classes one cannon or heavy guns two howitzers for field mountain or siege use which are lighter and shorter than cannon and designed to throw hollow projectiles with comparatively small charges three mortars for throwing shells at a great elevation the modern long-range guns and improved howitzers have however virtually superseded mortars machine guns of various forms are comparatively small and light transportable by hand and fill in a place between cannon and small arms the later term embracing the soldier's personal armament of rifle and pistol or revolver which are carried in the hand a group of guns of the light design are generally given the name of their first inventor or the place of manufacture such as the armstrong gun the vickers maxim the martini henry rifle or the enfield the indifferent use of several expressions in describing the same weapon is, however, rather confusing. One particular gun may thus be referred to, by its weight in tons, or CWT, as a 35-ton gun, by the weight of its projectile, as a 68-pounder, by its caliber, that is, the size of bore, as the 4-inch gun. Of these, the heavier breech-loading, BL, and quick firing qf guns are generally known by the size of bore small qfs field guns and c by the weight of projectile it is therefore desirable to enter these particulars together when making any list of service ordnance for future reference no individual gun whether large or small is a single whole but consists of several pieces fastened together by many clever devices the principal parts of a cannon are one the chase or main tube in which the projectile is loaded terminating at one end in the muzzle two the breech piece consisting of a 
the chamber which is bored out for a larger diameter than a chase to contain the firing charge b the breech plug which is closed before the charge is exploded and screwed tightly into place sealing every aperture by means of a special device called the obturator in order to prevent any gases passing out round it instead of helping to force the projectile forwards toward the muzzle the whole link of inside tube is termed the barrel as in a machine gun rifle or sporting piece but in the latter two weapons the breech opening is closed by sliding or springing back the breech block or bolt into firing position old weapons as a rule were smooth bored s b firing a round missile between which and a barrel a considerable amount of gases generated by the explosion escaped and caused loss of power this escape of gas being known as windage in all modern weapons we use conical projectiles fitted near the base with a soft copper driving band the diameter of which is somewhat larger than that of the bore of the gun and cut a number of spiral grooves in the barrel the enormous pressure generated by the explosion of charge forces the projectile down the bore of the gun and out the muzzle the body of the projectile made of steel or iron being smaller in diameter than the bore easily passes through but the driving band being of greater diameter and being composed of soft copper can only pass down the bore with the projectile by flowing into the grooves thus preventing any escape of gas and being forced to follow their twist it therefore rotates rapidly on its own longitudinal axis while passing down the barrel and on leaving the muzzle two kinds of velocity have been imparted to it first a velocity of motion through the air secondly a velocity of rotation round its axis which causes it to fly steadily onward in the required direction i e prolongation of the axis of the gun thus extreme velocity and penetrating power as well as correctness of aim are acquired the path of a projectile through the air is called a trajectory and if uninterrupted its flight would continue on indefinitely in a perfectly straight line but immediately a shot has been hurled from the gun by the explosion in its rear two other natural forces begin to act upon it gravitation which tends to bring it to earth air resistance which gradually checks its speed theoretically a bullet dropped perpendicularly from the muzzle of a perfectly horizontal rifle would reach the ground at the same moment as another bullet fired from the muzzle horizontally the action of gravity being the same in both cases its direct even course is therefore deflected till it forms a curve and sooner or later it returns to earth still retaining a part of its velocity to counteract the attraction of gravity the shot is thrown upwards by elevating the muzzle care being taken to direct the gun's action to the same height above the object as the force of gravitation would draw the projectile down during the time of flight the gunner is enabled to give the proper inclination to its piece by means of the sights one of these near the muzzle being generally fixed while that next the breech is adjustable by sliding up an upright bar which is so graduated that the proper elevation for any required range is given the greater the velocity the flatter is the trajectory and the more dangerous to the enemy assuming the average height of a man is six feet all the distance intervening between the point where the bullet has dropped to within six feet of the earth and the point where it actually strikes is dangerous to any one in that interval which is called the danger zone a higher initial velocity is gained by using stronger firing charges in a more extended flight by making a projectile longer in proportion to its diameter the reason why a shell from a cannon travels further than a rifle bullet both having the same muzzle velocity is easily explained a rifle bullet is let us assume three times as long as it is thick a cannon shell the same if the shell have ten times the diameter of the bullet its nose will have ten times ten equals one hundred times the area of the bullet's nose but its mass will be ten times ten times ten equals one thousand times that of the bullet in other words when two bodies are proportional in all their dimensions their air resistance varies as a square of their diameters but their mass and consequently their momentum varies as a cube of their diameters the shell therefore starts with a great advantage over a bullet 
and may be compared to a crew of cyclists on a multi-cycle all cutting the same path through the air whereas the bullet resembles a single rider who has to overcome as much air resistance as the front man of the crew but not the weight of other riders behind to help him as regards the effect of rifling it is to keep the bullet from turning head over heels as it flies through the air and to maintain its always point forwards every boy knows that a top sleeps best when it's spinning fast its horizontal rotation overcomes a tendency to vertical movement towards the ground in like manner a rifle bullet spinning vertically overcomes an inclination of its atoms to move out of the horizontal path professor john perry f r s has illustrated this gyroscopic effect as it is called of a whirling body with a heavy flywheel in a case held by a man standing on a pivoted table however much of the man may try to turn the top from its original direction he will fail as long as its velocity of rotation is high he may move the top relatively to his body but the table will turn so as to keep the center line of the top always pointing in the same direction rifles up to the middle of last century our soldiers were armed with a flintlock musket known as brown bess a smooth bore barrel three-quarter inch in diameter thirty-nine inches long weighing with its bayonet over eleven pounds the round laden bullet weighed an ounce and had to be wrapped in a patch or bit of oily rag to make it fit the barrel and prevent windage it was then pushed home with a ramrod on to the powder charge which was ignited by a spark passing from the flint into a priming of powder how little its accuracy of aim could be depended upon however is proved by the word of command when advancing upon an enemy wait till you see the whites of their eyes boys before you fire in the year sixteen eighty each troop of life guards was supplied with eight rifled carbines a modest allowance possibly intended to be used merely by those acting as scouts after this we hear nothing of them until in eighteen hundred the ninety fifth regiment received a twenty bore muzzle loading rifle exchanged about eighteen thirty five for the brunswick rifle firing a spherical bullet an improvement that more than doubled its effective range the company so armed became known as the rifle brigade at last in eighteen forty two the old flintlock was superseded for the whole army by the original percussion musket a smooth bore whose charge was exploded by a percussion cap made of copper that this copper had some commercial value was shown by the rush of ruffs to outer shot and elsewhere upon a field day to collect the split fragments which strewed the ground after the troops had withdrawn soon afterward the barrel was rifled and an elongated bullet brought into use this missile was pointed in front and had a hollowed base so contrived that it expanded immediately the pressure of exploding gases was brought to bear on it and thus filled up the grooves preventing any windage the one adopted by our army in the year eighteen fifty two was a production of the m minnie a frenchman though an expanding bullet of english invention had been brought forward several years before meanwhile the prussians had their famous needle gun a breech-loading rifled weapon fired by a needle attached to a sliding bolt as the bolt is shot forward the needle pierces the charge and ignites the fulminite by friction this rifle was used in the prusso-austrian war of eighteen sixty six some twenty years after its first inception and the french promptly countered it by arming their troops with the chase pot rifle an approved addition of the same principle a piece which could be charged and fired in any position from five to seven times as fast as a muzzle loader which a soldier had to load standing naturally caused a revolution in the infantry armament of other nations the english government as usual the last to make a change decided in eighteen sixty four upon using breech loading rifles till a more perfect weapon could be obtained the infields were at a small outlay converted into breech loaders after the plans of mr snyder and were henceforward known as snyder enfields eventually as the result of open competition the martini henry rifle was produced by combining henry's system of rifling with martini's mechanism for breech loading this weapon had seven grooves with one turn in twenty two inches and weighed with bayonet ten pounds four ounces it fired with great accuracy 
the trajectory having a rise of only eight feet at considerable distances so that the bullet would not pass over the head of cavalrymen twenty rounds could be fired in fifty three seconds now in the later years of the century all weapons had been superseded by magazine rifles i e rifles which could be fired several times without recourse to the ammunition pouch they differ from the revolver in having only one firing chamber into which the cartridges are one by one brought by simple action of the breech mechanism which also extracts the empty cartridge case the bore of these rifles is smaller and the rifling sharper they therefore shoot straighter and harder than the large bore and owing to the use of new explosives the recoil is less the french level magazine rifle was a pioneer of all now used by european nations though a somewhat similar weapon was familiar to the americans since eighteen forty nine being first used during the civil war the henry rifle as it was called afterwards became the winchester the german army rifle is the mauser so familiar to us in the hands of the boers during the south african war loading five cartridges at once in a case or clip which falls out when empty the same rifle had been adopted by turkey and was used by the spaniards in the late spanish-american war the austrian manlicher adopted by several continental nations in the crag jorgensen now used in the north of europe and as the united states army weapon resembled the mauser in most particulars each of these loads the magazines in one movement with a clip the hotchkiss magazine rifle has its magazine in the stock holding five extra cartridges pushed successfully into loading position by a spiral spring our forces are now armed principally with the lee enfield which has taken the place of the lee medford issued a few years ago these are small bore rifles of dot three o three inch caliber having a detachable box which is loaded with ten cartridges lee medford eight passed up in turn by a spring into the breech whence when the bolt is closed they are pushed into firing chamber the empty case is ejected by pulling back the bolt and at the same time another cartridge is pressed up from the magazine and the whole process repeated when a cutoff is used the rifle may be loaded and fired singly be the magazine full or empty the lee enfield has five grooves lee met for ten making one complete turn from right to left in every ten inches it weighs nine pounds four ounces and a barrel is thirty point one nine seven inches long the range averages thirty five hundred yards we are now falling into line with other powers by adopting the clip form instead of the box for loading the sealed pattern of the new service weapon is thus provided and has also been made somewhat lighter and shorter while preserving the same velocity we are promised an even more rapid firing rifle than any of these one in which the recoil is used toward the breech and lock so that it is a veritable automatic gun indeed several continental nations have made a trial of such weapons and reported favorably upon them one lately tried in italy works by means of gas generated by the explosion passing through a small hole to move a piston rod it is claimed that the magazine can hold as many as fifty cartridges and fire up to thirty rounds a minute but the barrel became so hot after doing this that the trial had to be stopped the principal result of an automatic action would probably be excessive waste of cartridges by wild firing in the excitement of an engagement it is today as true as formerly that it takes on an average man's weight of lead to kill him in battle to our neighbors across the channel the credit also belongs of introducing smokeless powder now universally used that of lee medford being cordite to prevent the bullets flattening on impact they are coated with a hard metal such as nickel and its alloys if the nose is soft or split beforehand a terribly enlarged or lacerated wound is produced so the geneva convention humanely prohibited the use of such missiles in warfare before quitting this part of our subject it is well to add a few words about pistols these have passed through much the same process of evolution as the rifle and have now accumulated in the many shotted revolver during the period of fourteen eighty to fifteen hundred the matchlock revolver is so to have been brought into use and one attributed to this date may be seen in the tower of london two hundred years ago richards a london glensmith converted the ancient wheel lock into the flintlock 
he also rifled his barrel and loaded it at the breech the richard's weapon was double barreled and unscrewed for loading at the point where the powder chamber ended the ball was placed in the chamber in close contact with the powder and a barrel rescrewed the bullet being a soft leaden ball was forced when the charge was fired through the rifled barrel with great accuracy of aim the percussion cap did not oust the flint lock till less than a century ago when many single barrel pistols such as the famous derringer were produced these in their turn were replaced by the revolver which colt introduced in eighteen thirty six to eighteen fifty smith and wesson in the early sixties improved upon it by a device for extracting the empty cartridges automatically livermore and russell of the united states invented the clip containing several cartridges but the equally well-known winchester has its cartridges arranged in a tube below the barrel whence a helical spring feeds them into the breech as fast as they are needed at the present time each war department has its own special service weapon the german mauser magazine pistol for officers use fires ten shots in ten seconds a slight pressure of the trigger setting the full machinery in motion the pressure of the gas as each explosion does all the rest of the work extracts and ejects the cartridge case cocks the hammer and presses springs which reload and close the weapon all in a fraction of a second the man lyncher is one of the same automatic type but its barrel moves to the front leaving space for a fresh cartridge to come up from the magazine below while in the mouths of the breech moves to the rear during recoil the range is a half mile the cartridges are made up in sets of ten in a case which can be inserted in one movement machine guns intermediate between hand-borne weapons and artillery and partaking of the nature of both come the machine guns firing small projectiles with extraordinary rapidity since the united states made trial of dr gatlin's miniature battery of the civil war eighteen sixty two to eighteen sixty five invention has been busy evolving more and more perfect types till the most modern machine gun is a marvel of ingenuity and effectiveness the gatlin machine gun which has been much improved in late years by the Eccles system of feed and is not yet completely out of date consists of a circular series of ten barrels each with its own lock mounted on a central shaft and revolved by a suitable gear the cartridges are successfully fed by automatic actions into the barrels and the hammers are so arranged that the entire operation of loading closing the breech firing and withdrawing the empty cartridge cases which is known as their longitudinal reciprocating motion is carried on while the locks are kept in constant revolution along with the barrels and breech by means of a hand crank one man places a feed case filled with cartridges into the hopper another turns a crank as the gun is rotated the cartridges drop one by one from the feed cases into the grooves of the carrier and its lock load feeds and fires each in turn while the gun revolves further the lock drawing back extracts and drops the empty case it is then ready for the next cartridge in action five cartridges are always going through some process of loading while five empty shells are in different stages of ejection the latest type fitted with an electromotor will fire at the rate of one thousand rounds per minute and eighty rounds have actually been fired within ten seconds it is not however safe to work these machine guns so fast as the cartridges are apt to be occasionally pulled through unfired and then explode at the men's legs the automatic guns on the contrary as they only work by the explosion are free from any risk of such accidents the feed drum contains a hundred and four cartridges and can be replaced almost instantly one drum full can be discharged in five and a quarter seconds the small size gatlin has a drum feed of four hundred cartridges in sixteen sections of twenty-five with each passed up without interruption the gun is mounted for use so that it can be pointed at any angle and through a wide lateral range without moving the carriage the gardener the gatlin as originally made was for a time superseded by the gardener which differed from it in having the barrels four or fewer in number fixed in the same horizontal plane this was worked by a rotary handle on the side of the gun the cartridges slid down a feed case in a column to the barrel 
where they were fired by a spring acting on a hammer. The Nordenfelt. Mr. Nordenfelt's machine gun follows this precedent. Its barrels, 10, 5, 4, 2, or 1 in number, also being arranged horizontally in a strong, rigid frame. Each barrel has its own breech plug, striker, spring, and extractor, and each fires independently of the rest, so that all are not out of action together. The gun has a swiveled mount easily elevated and trained, and the steel frames take up the force of the discharge. In rapid firing, one gunner can work the firing handle while another lays and alters the direction. The firing is operated by a lever working backwards and forwards by hand, and the gun can be discharged at a rate of 600 rounds per minute. The Hotchkiss The Hotchkiss gun, or revolving cannon, is on a fresh system, that of intermittent rotation of the barrels without any rotation of breech or mechanism. There is only one loading piston, one spring striker, and one extractor for all the barrels. The shock of discharge is received against a massive fixed breech, which distributes it to the whole body. Like the Nordenfelt, however, it can be dismounted and put together again without the need of tools. The above pattern throws one-pound projectiles. The Maxim Differing from all these comes the Maxim gun. So much in evidence now with both land and sea service. It is made up of two portions. One fixed, a barrel casing, which is also a water jacket and breech casing, two, recoiling, a barrel and two side plates which carry lock and crank. This recoiling portion works inside the fixed. The gun is supplied with ammunition by a belt holding 250 cartridges passing through a feed block on the top. Its mechanism is worked automatically, first by the explosion of the charge, which causes the barrel to recoil backwards and extends a strong spring which, on reasserting itself, carries it forward again. The recoiling part moves back about an inch, and this recoil is utilized by bringing into play mechanism which extracts the empty cartridge case, and on the spring carrying the barrel forward again, moves a fresh one into position. Under the barrel casing is the ejector tube through which the empty cartridge cases are ejected from the gun. The rate of fire of the Maxim gun is 600 rounds per minute, Deliberate fire means about 70 rounds per minute. Rapid fire will explode 450 rounds in the same time. As the barrel becomes very hot in use, the barrel casing contains 7 pints of water to keep it cool. About 2,000 rounds can be fired at short intervals. But in continuous firing, the water boils after some 600 rounds. It needs replenishing after about 1,000. A valve tube allows steam, but not water to escape. The operator works his gun by pressing a firing lever or button. After starting the machine, he merely sits behind the shield, which protects him from the enemy, directing it, as it keeps on firing automatically so long as the bands of cartridges are supplied and a finger held on a trigger or button. By setting a free couple of levers with his left hand, and by pressing a shoulder against a padded shoulder piece, he is able to elevate or depress, or train a barrel horizontally, without in any way interfering with a hail of missiles. We use two sizes, one with a .45 bore for the Navy, which takes an all-lead bullet weighing 480 grains, and the other is a .303 bore, the ordinary nickel-coated rifle bullet for the Army. But as the Maxim gun can be adapted to every rifle caliber ammunition, it is patronized by all governments. The gun itself weighs 56 pounds, and is mounted for use in various ways, on a tripod, a field stand, or a field carriage with wheels. This carriage has 16 boxes of ammunition, each containing a belt of 250 cartridges, making 4,000 rounds altogether. Its total weight is about a half a ton, so that it can be drawn by one horse, and it is built for the roughest cross-country work. A little machine, which can be fixed to the wheel, recharges the belt with cartridges by the working of a handle. For ships, the Maxim is usually mounted on the ordinary naval cone mount, or it can be clamped to the bulwark of the deck or the military top on the mast. But there is a most ingenious form of parapet mounting, known as the garrison mount, 
which turns the maxim into a disappearing gun and can be used equally well for fortress walls or improvisioned entrenchments the gun is placed over two little wheels on which it can be run along by means of a handle pushed behind in something the fashion of a lawnmower arrived at its destination the handle which is really a rack is turned downwards and on twisting one of the wheels the gun climbs it by means of a pinion cog till it points over the wall to which hooks at the end of two projecting bars firmly fix it the broadened end of the handle being held by the weight to the ground it is locked while in use but a few turns of the wheel and cause it to sink out of sight in as many seconds the rifle caliber guns may also be used as very light horse artillery to accompany cavalry by being mounted on a galloping carriage drawn by a couple of horses and with two seats for the operators the carriage conveys three thousand rounds and a steel-plated seat turns up and forms shields during action it is interesting to notice that an extra light form of the gun is made which may be carried strapped on an infantryman's back and fired from a tripod two of these mounted on a double tricycle can be propelled at a good pace along a fairly level road and the riders dismounting have in a few moments a valuable little battery at their disposal the pom-pom of which we heard so much in the late war is a large edition of the maxim automatic system with some differences in the system its caliber is one and a half inches instead of bullets it emits explosive shells one pound in weight fitted with percussion fuses which burst them into about twelve or fourteen pieces the effective range is up to two thousand yards and it will carry to four thousand yards an approved pom-pom recently brought out hurls a one and a quarter pound shell with effect at a mark of three thousand yards away and as far as six thousand yards before its energy is entirely exhausted the muzzle velocity of this weapon is two thousand three hundred fifty feet a second as against the eighteen hundred feet of the older pattern they both fire three hundred rounds a minute the colt automatic gun is an american invention whose automatic action is due to explosion of the charge not to recoil the force by which the motions of firing extracting and loading are performed is derived from the powdered gases a portion of which passing through a small vent in the muzzle acts by means of a lever on the mechanism of the gun this is also in two parts a barrel attached to b breech casing in which gear for charging firing and ejecting is contained the barrel made of strong alloy of nickel has its cartridges fed in by means of belts coiled in boxes attached to the breech casing the box is moving with the latter so the movements of the gun do not affect it these boxes contain two hundred fifty cartridges each and are easily replaced the feed belt is inserted and the lever thrown down and moved backward once by hand as far as it will go this opens the breech and passes the first cartridge from the belt to the carrier the lever is then released and the spring causes it to fly forward close the vent and transfer the cartridge from the carrier to the barrel also compressing the mainspring and opening and closing the breech on pulling the trigger the shot is fired and after the bullet has passed the little vent but is not yet out of the muzzle the force of expanding gas acted through the vent on the piston sets a gas lever in operation which acts the breech mechanism opens breech ejects cartridge case and feeds another cartridge into the carrier the gas lever returning forces the cartridge home in a barrel and closes and locks the breech the hammer of the gun acts as the piston of an air pump forcing a strong jet of air into the chamber and through the barrel thus removing all unburnt powder and thoroughly cleansing it the metal employed is strong enough to resist the heaviest charge of nacho powder and the accuracy of its aim is not disturbed by the vibrations of rapid fire it does not heat fast so has no need of water jacket any surplus heat being removed by system of radiation the bore is made of any rifle caliber for any small arm ammunition and is fitted with a safety lock for our own pieces we use the lee medford cartridges four hundred shots per minute can be fired the gun consists altogether of ninety-four pieces but the working pieces i e those only which need to be separated for cleaning and c when in the hands of the artilleryman are less than twenty 
it can be handled in action by one man the operation resembling that of firing a pistol the machine weighs forty pounds and for use by cavalry or infantry can be mounted on the dundonald galloping carriage the ammunition box containing two thousand rounds ready for use carries the gun on its upper side and is mounted on a strong steel axle a pole with a slotted end is inserted into the revolving funnel on the bend of the shaft the limbering up being completed by an automatic bolt and plug the gun carriage itself is of steel with hickory wheels and hickory and steel shafts detachable at will the simple harness suits are saddle cavalry horse and the shafts work in sockets behind the rider's legs its whole weight with full load of ammunition is under four hundred weight End of chapter 6, part 1chapter six of the romance of modern invention this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kirk hendrick trinity florida the romance of modern invention by archibald williams chapter six part two modern artillery heavy ordnance explosives in the gun factory Heavy ordnance. As with rifles and smaller forms of artillery, so also with heavy ordnance, the changes and improvements within the last fifty years have been greater than those made during the course of all previous centuries. These changes have affected alike not only the materials from which a weapon is manufactured, the relative size of caliber and the length of bore, the fashion of mounting and firing, but also the form and weight of the projectile the velocity with which it is thrown, and even the substances used in expelling it from the gun. Compare for a moment the old cast-iron muzzle loaders, stubby of stature, which Wellington's bronzed veterans served with round cannonballs, well packed in greasy clouts to make them fit tight, or with shell and grape shot, throughout the hard-fought day of Waterloo, from a distance which chronicles measure by paces so near stood the opposing ranks to one another. Or stand in imagination upon one of Nelson's stately men o' war and watch the grimy guns crews, eight or ten to each, straining on the ropes. See the still smoking piece hauled inbound, its bore swabbed out to clean and cool it, then recharged by the muzzle. Home go powder, wad, and a caster full of balls or the chain shot to splinter the enemy's mast rammed well down ere the gun is again run out through the porthole now the gunner snatches the flaming lintstock and signal given applies it to the powder grains sprinkled into the touch hole a salvo of fifty starboard guns go off in one terrific broadside crashing across the frenchman's decks at such close quarters that in two or three places they are set on fire by the burning wads. Next comes a cry of boarders, and the ships are grappled as the boarding party scrambles over the bulwarks to the enemy's deck. A brisk musket fire from the crowded rigging protecting their advance. Meanwhile, the labored guns, with their simultaneous discharge, are greeting a new adversary. Such was war a century ago. Compare with it the late south african campaign where the range guns was estimated in miles and after a combat lasting from morn to eve the british general could report i do not think we have seen a gun or bore all day the days of hand-to-hand -hand fighting have passed the melee in the ranks may be seen no more in a few years the bayonet may be regulated to the limbo of the coat of mail or the cast-iron culverin Yet the modern battle scene bristles with the most death-dealing weapons which the ingenuity of man has ever constructed. The hand-drawn machine gun discharges in a couple of minutes as many missiles as a regiment of Wellington's infantry, with a speed and precision undreamt of by him. The quick-firing, long-range naval guns now in vogue could annihilate a fleet or destroy a port without approaching close enough to catch a glimpse of the personnel of their opponents. The deadly torpedo guards are waterways more effectively than a squadron of ships. All resources of civilization have been drawn upon, 
every triumph of engineering secured to forge such weapons as shall strike the hardest and destroy the most pitilessly but strange and unexpected the result where we counted our battle slain by thousands we now mourn over the death of hundreds where whole regiments were mown down our ambulances gather wounded in scattered units here is the bright side of modern war the muzzle-loading gun has had its day a very long day and a successful one again and again it has reasserted itself and ousted its rivals but at last all difficulties of construction have been surmounted and a breech-loader has come to stay however our services still contain a large number of muzzle-loading guns many of them built at quite a recent period and adapted as far as possible to modern requirements so to these we will first turn our attention the others guns were made of cast iron but this being prone to burst with a large charge bronze brass and other tougher materials were for a long time employed most elaborately chased and ornamented specimens of these old weapons are to be seen in the tower and many other collections in the utilitarian days of the past century cheapness and speed and manufacture were more sought after than show iron was worked in many new ways to resist the pressure of explosion armstrong of ellswick conceived the idea of building up a barrel of coiled iron by joining a series of short welded cylinders together and closing them by a single forged breech piece over all again wrought iron coils were shrunk subsequently he tried a solid forged iron barrel board out to form a tube neither make proving very satisfactory steel tubes were next used but were too expensive and uncertain at that stage of manufacture again coiled iron was called into requisition and mr fraser of the royal gun factory introduced a system of double and triple coils which was found very successful especially when a thin steel inner tube was substituted for the iron one 1869 all these weapons were rifled so that there was of necessity a corresponding difference in the projectile employed conical shells being used studs were now placed on the body of the shell to fit into the rifling grooves which were made few in number and deeply cut this was apt to weaken the bore of the gun but on the other hand many studs to fit into several shallow grooves weakened the cover of shells various modifications were tried and finally a gas check which expands into the grooves was placed at the base of the shell the muzzle loader having thus been turned into a very efficient modern weapon the next problem to be solved was how to throw a projectile with sufficient force to penetrate the iron and steel armor plates then being generally applied to warships build larger guns was a conclusion arrived at and presently the arsenals of the powers were turning out mammoth weapons up to a hundred tons and even a hundred and ten tons in weight with a caliber of sixteen inches and more for their huge shells then was the mighty thirty-five ton woolwich infant born eighteen seventy two and its younger but still bigger brothers eighty-one tons sixteen inch bore followed by the elswick one hundred ton giants some of which were mounted on our defenses in the mediterranean but the fearful conclusion of such enormous guns when fixed in action on board ship injured the superstruction and even destroyed the boats and the great improvements made in steel both for guns and armor soon led to a fresh revolution henceforward instead of mounting a few very heavy guns we have preferred to trust to the weight of metal projected by an increased number of smaller size but much higher velocity and these guns are quick firing breech loaders the heaviest of our up-to-date ordnance is of moderate caliber the largest breech loaders being twelve inch ten inch and nine point two inch guns but the elaborateness of its manufacture is such that one big gun takes nearly as long to build up as a ship for which it is destined each weapon has to pass through about sixteen different processes one the solid or hollow ingot is forged 
2. Anneal, to get rid of strains. 3. It is placed horizontally on a lathe and rough turned. 4. Rough board in a lathe. 5. Hardened. Heated to a high temperature and plunged, while hot, into a bath of rape oil kept cold by a water bath. It cools slowly for seven to eight hours, being moved about at intervals by a crane. This makes the steel more elastic and tenacious. 6. Annealed, i.e. reheated to 900 degrees Fahrenheit and slowly cooled. Siemens pyrometer is used in these operations. 7. Tested by pieces cut off. 8. Turned and bored for the second time. 9. Carefully turned again for shrinkage. Outer coil expanded till large enough to fit easily over inner. Inside, set up vertically in a pit, has outside lowered onto it. Water and gas being applied to make all shrink evenly. Other projections, hoops, rings, and C, also shrunk on. 10. Finish. Board and chambered. 11. Broached or very fine board, perhaps lapped with lead and emery. 12. Rifled horizontally in a machine. 13. Prepared for breech fitting. 14. Taken to the proof butts for trial. 15. Drilled for sockets, sights, and C. Lined and engraved. Breech fittings, locks, electric firing gear, and C added. Small adjustments made by filing. 16. Browned or painted. When worn, the bore can be lined with a new steel tube. These lengthy operations completed, our gun has still to be mounted upon its field carriage, naval cone, or disappearing mounting, any of which are complicated and delicately adjusted pieces of mechanism, the product of much time and labor, which we have no space here to describe. Some account of the principal parts of these guns has already been given, but the method by which the breech is closed remains to be dealt with. It will be noticed that though guns now barely reach half the height of the monster muzzle loaders, they are even more effective. Thus the 46-ton, 12-inch gun hurls an 850-pound projectile with a velocity of 2,750 foot-seconds and uses a comparatively small charge. The famous 81-ton needed a very big charge for its 1,700-pound shell and had little more than half the velocity and no such power of penetration. This change has been brought about by using a slower burning explosive very powerful in its effects, enlarging the chamber to give it sufficient air space, and lengthening the chase of the gun so that every particle of the powder gas may be brought into action before the shot leaves the muzzle. This system and the substitution of steel for the many layers of welded iron makes our modern guns long and slim in comparison with the older ones. To resist the pressure of the explosion against the breech end, a tightly fitting breech plug must be employed. The most modern and ingenious is the Wieland plug, invented by a Swedish engineer. The ordinary interrupted screw breech plug has three parts of its circumference plane and the other three parts threaded or grooved to screw into corresponding grooves in the breech. Thus, only half of the circumference is engaged by the screw. Mr. Whelan has cut steps on the plug, three of which would be threaded to one plane segment, each locking with its counterpart in the breech. In this case, there are three segments engaged to each one left plane, and the strength of the screw is almost irresistible. The plug, which is hinged at the side, has therefore been shortened by one-third, and is light enough to swing clear with one touch of the hand wheel that first rotates and unlocks it. The method of firing is this. The projectile lifted by hydraulic power on a ship 
into the loading tray is swung to the mouth of the breech and pushed into the bore. A driving band attached near its base is so notched at the edges that it jams the shell closely and prevents it from slipping back if loaded at a high angle of elevation. The powder charge being placed in the chamber, the breech plug, is now swung to and turned till it locks close. The vent axial, or inner part of the breech plug, next to the charge, which is called from its shape the mushroom head, encloses between its head and the screw plug the debange obturator, a flat canvas pad of many layers soaked with mutant fat tightly packed between discs of tin. When the charge explodes, the mushroom head, forced back upon the pad, compresses it till its edges bulge against the tube and prevent any escape of gas breechwards. The electric spark which fires the charge is passed in from outside by means of a minute and ingenious apparatus fitted into a little vent or tube in a mushroom head. As the electric circuit cannot be completed till the breech plug is screwed quite home, there is now no more fear of a premature explosion than of double loading. If the electric gear is disordered, the gun can be fired equally well and safely by a percussion tube. This description is of a typical large gun and may be applied to all calibers and also to the larger quick fires. The mechanism as the breech is swung open again withdraws the empty cartridge. So valuable has the bang's obturator proved, however, that guns up to the 6 inch caliber now have the powder charge thrown into the chamber in bags, thus saving the weight of the metal tubes hitherto necessary. Of course, several types of breech loading guns are used in the service but the above are the most modern. The favorite mode of construction at the present time is a wire-wound barrel, the building up of which is completed by covering the many layers of wire with an outer tube or jacket, expanded by heat before it is slipped on, in order that it may fit closely when cold. A previous make without wire is strengthened by rings or hoops also shrunk on hot. The quick fires proper are of many sizes, 8 inch, 7.5 inch, 6 inch, 4.7 inch, 4 inch, and 3 inch, 12 pounders. The naval type is as a rule longer and lighter than those made from the rough usage of the field campaigning and have much greater range. There are also smaller quick fires, 3 pounders and 6 pounders, with bore something over 1 inch and 2 inch, Nordenfelt, Hotchkiss, Vickers Maxim some of the high-velocity 12-pounders being employed as garrison guns along with the 6-inch and 4.7-inch and the large caliber howitzers. We still use howitzer batteries of 5-inch bore in the field and in the siege train, all being short, rifled, breech-loading weapons, as they throw a heavy shell with smallest charges at a high angle of elevation, but cover a relatively short distance. A new pattern of 8-inch caliber is now under consideration. It is interesting to contrast the potencies of some of these guns, all of which use cordite charges. Caliber, 12-inch, charge, 207 pounds, weight of shot, 850 pounds, muzzle velocity in foot seconds, 2,750, number of rounds per minute, 1. Caliber, 8-inch. Charge, 52 pounds. Weight of shot, 210 pounds. Muzzle velocity in foot seconds, 2,750. Number of rounds per minute, 5. Caliber, 6 inch. Charge, 25 pounds. Weight of shot, 100 pounds. Muzzle velocity in foot seconds, 2,775. Number of rounds per minute, 8. Caliber, 4.7 inch. Charge, 9 pounds. Weight of shot, 45 pounds. Muzzle velocity in foot seconds, 2,600. Number of rounds per minute, 12. Caliber, 3 inch. Charge, 2 pounds, 9 ounces. Weight of shot, 12.5 pounds. Muzzle velocity in foot seconds, 2,600. Number of rounds per minute, 20. In the armament of our fine navy guns are roughly distributed as follows. 81 ton, 13 and one half inch, 
and superseded patterns of machine guns such as Gatlin's, Gardner's, and Nordenfelt's, besides a few surviving muzzle loaders, and C, are carried only by the oldest battleships. The first class battleships are chiefly supplied with four 12 inch guns and barbettes, 12 6 inch as secondary batteries, and a number of smaller quick firers on the upper decks and in the fighting tops, also for use in the boats to which are added several maxims. The first class cruisers have 9.2 as their largest caliber, with a lessened proportion of 6 inch and C. Some of the newest bear only 7.5 or 6 inch guns as their heaviest ordnance, like the second class cruisers which, however, add several 4.7s between these and their small quick fires. Vessels of inferior size usually carry nothing more powerful than the 4.7. All are now armed with torpedo tubes. These same useful little quick firers and machine guns have been the lethal weapons which made the armored trains so formidable. Indeed, there seems no limit to their value both for offense and defense, for the battle chariot of the ancient Britain has its modern successor in the Sims motor war car lately exhibited at the Crystal Palace. This armor-plated movable fort is intended primarily for coast defense, but can work off beaten tracks over almost any sort of country. It is propelled at the rate of 9 miles an hour by a 16 horsepower motor, carrying all of its own fuel, two pom-poms, two small maxims, and 10,000 rounds of ammunition besides the necessary complement of men and searchlights for night use, etc. The searchlight, by the way, has taken the place of all former inventions thrown from guns, such as ground light balls or parachute lights with a time fuse which burst in the air and remained suspended, betraying the enemy's proceedings. In like manner, the link chain and double-headed shot, the canister, iron balls, packed in a thin iron or tin cylinders, which would travel about 350 yards, the carcasses, filled with the inflammable composition for firing ships and villages, are as much out of date as a solid round shot or cannonball. Young Shrapnel's invention a century ago, of the form of shell that bears his name, a number of balls arranged in a case containing also a small bursting charge fired either by percussion or by a time fuse, has practically replaced them all. Thrown with great precision of aim, its effective range is now up to 5,000 yards. A 15-pounder shrapnel shell, for instance, contains 192 bullets and covers several hundred yards with the scattered missiles flying with extreme velocity. Common shell, from 2.5 to 3 calibers long, contain an explosive only. Another variety is segment shell, made of pieces built up in a ring with a bursting charge in the center which presently shatters it. The Pollister shell has a marvelous penetrating power when used against iron plates, but Mirabel Dictu experiments tried within the past few months prove that a soft cap added externally enables a projectile to pierce with ease armor which had previously defied every attack. Explosives Half a century ago, gunpowder was still the one driving powder which started the projectile on its flight. It is composed of some 75 parts of saltpeter or nitrate or potash, 15 parts of carefully prepared charcoal, and 10 parts of sulfur. This composition imprisons a large amount of oxygen for combustion and is found to act most successfully when formed into rather large prismatic grains. On the abolition of the old flintlock, its place was taken by a detonating substance enclosed in a copper cap, and some time later inventors came forward with a new and more powerful explosives to supersede the use of gunpowder. By treating cotton with nitric and sulfuric acid reaction, gun cotton was produced, and a year later, glycerin treated in the same manner became known to commerce as nitroglycerin. This liquid form being inconvenient to handle, some inert granular substance, such as infusorial earth, was used to absorb the nitroglycerin, and dynamite was the result. The explosion of gun cotton was found to be too sudden and rapid for rifles or cannon. 
it was liable to burst the piece instead of blowing out the charge in order to lessen the rapidity of its ignition ordinary cotton was mixed with it or its threads were twisted round some inert substance when repeating rifles and machine guns came into general use a smokeless powder became necessary such powders as a rule contained nitro cellulose gun cotton or nitroglycerin or both these are combined into a plastic gluey composition which is then made up into sticks or pellets of various shapes and usually of a large size to lessen the extreme rapidity of their combustion substances such as tan paraffin starch bran peat and c and c and many mineral salts are used in forming low explosives from high ones to secure complete combustion some of the larger pellets are made with a central hole or even pierced by many holes so that fire penetrates the entire mass and carries off all its explosive qualities our cordite consists of nitroglycerin dissolving dinitrocellulose by the acid of a volatile solvent and a mineral jelly or oil this compound is semi-fluid and is being passed like macaroni through round holes in a metal plate it forms strings or cords of varying size according to the diameter of the holes hence the name cordite many experiments in search of more powerful explosives resulted in an almost universal adoption of picric acid as the base this acid is itself produced by the action of nitric acid upon carbolic acid and each nation has its own fashion of preparing it for artillery the french began with melanite in 1885 this being a mixture of picric acid and gun cotton the composition of lidite named from its place of manufacture lid in kent is a jealously guarded british secret this substance was first used in five-inch howitzers during the late Sudan campaign, playing a part in the bombardment of Omdurman. The effect of the 50-pound lidite shells upon the South African coves is described as astounding. When the yellow cloud has cleared away trees were seen uprooted, rocks pulverized, the very face of the earth had changed. Several attempts have been made to utilize dynamite for shells, some of the guns employing compressed air as their mode of power. The United States some years ago went to great expense in setting up for this purpose heavy pneumatic plant, which has recently been disposed of as too cumbrous. Dudley's aerial torpedo gun discharged a 13-pound shell containing explosive gelatin, gun cotton, and fulminite of mercury by igniting the small cordite charge in a parallel tube through a vent in which the partially cooled gases acted on a projectile in the barrel. This was rotated in the air by inclined blades on a tailpiece, as the barrel could not be rifled for fear of the heat set up by friction. Some guns actuated on much the same principle are said to have been used with effect in the Hispano-American War. Mr. Hudson Maxim, with his explosive Maximite, claims to throw half a ton of dynamite about a mile, and a one-ton shell to half that distance. But even these inventors are outstripped by Professor Birkeland, who undertakes to hurl a projectile weighing two tons from an iron tube coiled with copper wire down which an electric current is passed, thus doing away entirely with the need of a firing charge. In the Gun Factory let us pay a visit to one of our gun factories and get some idea of the multiform activities necessary to turning out complete of a single piece of ordnance or a complicated machine gun we enter the enormous workshop glazed as to roof and sides full of the varied buzz and whir and clank of the machinery up and down the long bays stand row upon row of lays turning, milling, polishing, boring, rifling, all moving automatically and with a precision which leaves nothing to be desired. That silent attendants seem to have nothing in their own hands. They simply watch that the cutting does not go too far, and with the touch of guiding handles regulate the pace or occasionally insert a fresh tool. The bits used in the processes are self-cleaning, 
so the machinery is never clogged and on the ground lie little heaps of brass chips cut away by the minute milling tools or in other places it is bestrewn with shavings of brass and steel which great chisels peel off as easily as a carpenter shaves a deal board here an enormous steel ingot forged solid heated again and again in a huge furnace and beaten by steam hammers or pressed by hydraulic power between each heating till it is brought to the desired size and shape is having its center bored through by a special drill which takes out a solid core this operation is termed trepanning and is applied to guns not exceeding eight inches those of larger caliber being rough bored on a lathe and mandrels placed in them during the subsequent forgings the tremendous heat generated during the boring process we may recall how benjamin thompson made water boil by the experimental boring of a cannon is kept down by streams of soapy water continually pumped through and over the metal we notice this flow of lubricating fluid in all directions from oil dropping slowly onto the small brass milling machines to this fountain play of water which makes a pleasant undertone amidst the jangle of the machines but these machines are less noisy than we anticipated in their actual workings they emit scarcely the slightest sound which strikes us more than the extreme exactness with which each does its portion of the work is the great deliberateness of its proceeding all the hurry and bustle is above us caused by the driving bands from the engine which keeps the whole machinery of the shed in motion suddenly with harsh creakings a great overhead crane comes drawing along the bay drops a chain grips up a gun barrel and handling this mass of many tons weight as easily as we should lift a walking stick swings it off to undergo another process of manufacture we pass on to the next lathe where a still larger forging is being turned externally supported on specially devised running gear many different cutters acting upon it at the same time so that it is gradually assuming the tapering banded appearance familiar to us in the completed state we turn fairly bewildered from one stage of manufacture to another here is a gun whose bore is being chambered to the size necessary for containing the firing charge further along we examine a more finished weapon in the process of preparation to receive the breech plug and other fittings still another we notice which has been fine bored to a beautifully smooth surface but is being improved yet more by lapping with lead and emery powder in the next shed a marvelous machine is rifling the interior of a barrel with dexterity absolutely uncanny for the tool which does the rifling has to be rotated in order to give the proper twist at the same moment as it is advancing lengthwise down the bore the grooves are not made simultaneously but as a rule one at a time the distance between them kept by measurements on a prepared disc now we have reached the apparatus for the wire wound guns a principle representing the knee plus ultra of strength and durability hitherto evolved the rough board gun is placed on a lathe which revolves slowly drawing on to it from a reel mounted at one side of a continuous layer of steel ribbon about a quarter of an inch wide on a twelve inch gun there is wound some one hundred seventeen miles of wire fourteen layers of it at the muzzle end and seventy-five at the breech end heavy weights regulate the tension of the wire which varies for each layer the outermost being the lowest tension which will resist a pressure of over one hundred tons to the square inch we next enter the division in which the gun cradles and mounts are prepared where we see some of the heaviest work carried out by electric dynamos the workman sitting on a raised platform to keep careful watch over his business passing through this with interested but cursory inspection of the cone mounting for quick firing naval guns some ingenious elevating and training gear and a field carriage whose hydraulic buffers merit closer examination we come to the shell department where all kinds of projectiles are manufactured shrapnel in its various forms armor piercing shells forged steel or cast iron and small brass cartridges 
for the machine guns may be found here and the beautifully delicate workmanship of the fuse arrangements attracts our admiration but we may not linger the plant for machine guns themselves claim our attention owing to the complexity and minute mechanism of these weapons almost a hundred different machines are needed some of the milling machines taking a large selection of cutters upon one spindle indeed in many parts of the works one notices the men changing their tools for others of different size or application some of the boring machines work two barrels at the same time others can drill three barrels or polish a couple simultaneously but there are hundreds of minute operations which need to be done separately down to the boring of screw holes and cutting the groove on a screw head many laborers are employed upon the lock alone and every portion is gauged correctly to the most infinitesimal fraction being turned out by the thousand that every separate item may be interchangeable among weapons of the same make look at a barrel which came gray and dull from its first turning now as it is dealt with changing into bright silver here it is adjusted upon the hydraulic rifling machine which will prepare it to carry the small arm bullet point three o three inch that one of larger calibers rifled to fire a small shell further on the barrels and their jackets are being fitted together and the different parts assembled and screwed up we have not time to follow the perfect implement to its mounting nor to do more than glance at those howitzers and the breech mechanism of the six-inch quick-fires near which our guide indicates piles of flat cases to keep the debange obturators from warping while out of use for the afternoon is waning and a foundry still unvisited to reach it we pass through the smith's shop and pause a while to watch a supply of spanners being roughly stamped by an immense machine out of metal plates and having their edges tidied off before they can be further perfected a steam hammer is busily engaged in driving mandrels of increasing size through the center of a red-hot forging the heat from the forges is tremendous and though it is tempered by a spray of falling water we are glad to escape into the next shed here we find skilled workmen carefully preparing molds by taking in sand the exact impression of a wooden dummy fortunately we arrive just as a series of casts deeply sunk in the ground are about to be made two brawny laborers bear forward an enormous iron crucible red hot from the furnace filled with seething liquid manganese bronze we are told which when an iron bar is dipped into it throws up tongues of beautiful greenish golden flame the smith stirs and clears off the scum as coolly as a cook skims her broth now it is ready the crucible is again lifted and its contents poured into a large funnel from which it flows into the molds beneath and fills them to the level of the floor at each one helper armed with an iron bar takes a stand and stirs again to work up the dross and air bubbles to the surface before the metal sets a scene worthy of a painter's brush and so we leave them end of chapter six Part 2、Chapter、Eight of the Romance of Modern Invention. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Romance of Modern Invention by Archibald Williams. Chapter 8 Dirigible Torpedoes. The history of warlike inventions is the history of a continual seesaw between the discovery of a new means of defense and the discovery of a fresh means of attack. At one time, a shield is devised to repel a javelin, at another, a machine to hurl the javelin with increased violence against the shield. Then the shield is reinforced by complete coats of mail, and so on. The ball of invention has rolled steadily on into our own times, gathering speed as it rolls. And bringing more and more startling revolutions in the art of war. Today it is a battle between the forces of nature, controllable by man in the shape of high explosives, and the resisting power of metals tempered to extreme toughness. At present it looks as if, on the sea at least, the attack were stronger than the defense. 
our warships may be cased in the hardest steel several inches thick until they become floating forts, almost impregnable to the heaviest shells. They may be provided with terrible engines able to give blow for blow, and be manned with the stoutest hearts in the world. And yet, were a sea fight in progress, a blow, crushing and resistless, might at any time come upon the vessel from a quarter whence, even though suspected, its coming might escape notice, below the water line. Were it possible to case an ironclad from deck to keel in foot-thick plating, the metal would crumple like a biscuit box under the terrible impact of the torpedo. This destructive weapon is an object of awe not so much from what it has done as from what it can do. The instances of a torpedo shivering a vessel in actual warfare are but few. Yet its moral effect must be immense. Even though it may miss its mark, the very fact of its possible presence will, especially at night time, tend to keep the commanding minds of a fleet very much on the stretch, and to destroy their efficiency. A torpedo knows no half-measures. It is either entirely successful or utterly useless. Its construction entails great expense, but inasmuch as it can, if directed all right, send a million of the enemy's money and a regiment of men to the bottom, the discharge of a torpedo is, after all, but the setting of a sprat to catch a whale. The aim of inventors has been to endow the dirigible torpedo, fit for use in the open sea, with such qualities that when once launched on its murderous course, it can pursue its course in the required direction without external help. The difficulties to be overcome in arriving at a serviceable weapon have been very great owing to the complexity of the problem. A torpedo cannot be fired through water like a cannon shell through air. Water, though yielding, is incompressible, and offers to a moving body a resistance increasing with the speed of that body. Therefore, the torpedo must contain its own motive power and its own steering apparatus, and be, in effect, a miniature submarine vessel complete in itself. To be out of sight and danger, it must travel beneath the surface and yet not sink to the bottom. To be effective, it must possess great speed, a considerable sphere of action, and be able to counteract any chance currents it may meet on its way. Among purely automobile torpedoes, the Whitehead is easily first. After thirty years, it still holds the lead for open sea work. It is a very marvel of ingenious adaption of means to an end and as it has fulfilled most successfully the conditions set forth above for an effective projectile, it will be interesting to examine in some detail this most valuable weapon. In 1873, one Captain Lupus of the Austrian Navy experimented with a small fire ship which he directed along the surface of the sea by means of ropes and guiding lines. This fire ship was to be loaded with explosives, which should ignite immediately on coming into collision with the vessel aimed at, the Austrian government declared his scheme unworkable in its crude form, and the captain looked about for someone to help him throw what he felt to be a sound idea into a practical shape. He found the man he wanted in Mr. Whitehead, who was at that time manager of an engineering establishment at Fume. Mr. Whitehead fell in enthusiastically with his proposition, at once discarded the complicated system of guiding ropes, and set to work to solve the problem on his own lines. At the end of two years, during which he worked in secret, aided only by a trusted mechanic and a boy, his son, he constructed the first torpedo of the type that bears his name. It was made of steel, was fourteen inches in diameter, weighed three hundred pounds, and carried eighteen pounds of dynamite as explosive charge. But its powers were limited. It could attain a rate of but six knots per hour under favorable conditions, and then for a short distance only. Its conduct was uncertain. Sometimes it would run along the surface at others make plunges for the bottom. However, the British government, recognizing the importance of Mr. Whitehead's work, encouraged him to perfect his instrument, and paid him a large sum for the patent rights. Pattern succeeded pattern, until comparative perfection was reached. Described briefly, the Whitehead torpedo is cigar-shaped, blunt-nosed, and tapering gradually towards the tail, so following the lines of a fish. Its length is twelve times its diameter, which varies in different patterns from fourteen to nineteen inches. At the fore end is a striker, and at the tail are a couple of three-bladed screws working on one shaft in opposite directions, to economize power and obviate any tendency of the torpedo to travel in a curve, and two sets of rudders, the one horizontal, the other vertical. The latest form of the torpedo has a speed of twenty-nine knots and a range of over a thousand yards. The torpedo is divided into five compartments by watertight steel bulkheads. At the front is the explosive head, containing wet gun cotton or some other explosive. The warhead, as it is called, is detachable, 
and for practice purposes its place is taken by a dummy head filled with wood to make the balance correct. Next comes the air chamber, filled with highly compressed air to drive the engines. After it, the balance chamber, containing the apparatus for keeping the torpedo at its proper depth. Then the engine room, and last of all, the buoyancy chamber, which is airtight and prevents the torpedo from sinking at the end of its run. To examine the compartments in order. In the very front of the torpedo is the pistol and primer charge for igniting the gun cotton. A special care has been taken over this part of the mechanism to prevent the torpedo being as dangerous to friends as to foes. The pistol consists of a steel plug sliding in a metal tube, at the back end of which is the fulminating charge. Until the plug is driven right in against this charge, there can be no explosion. Three precautions are taken against this happening prematurely. In the first place, there is on the forward end of the plug a thread cut, up which a screw fan travels as soon as it strikes the water. Until the torpedo has run forty-five feet, the fan has not reached the end of its travel, and the plug consequently cannot be driven home. Even when the plug is quite free, only a heavy blow will drive it in, as a little copper pin has to be sheared through by the impact. And before the screw can unwind at all, a safety pin must be withdrawn at the moment of firing, so that a torpedo is harmless until it has passed outside the zone of danger to the discharging vessel. The detonating charge is thirty-eight grains of full made of mercury, and the primer charge consists of six one-ounce discs of dry gun cotton contained in a copper cylinder, the front end of which is connected with the striker tube of the pistol. The fulminate, on receiving a blow, expands twenty-five hundred times, giving a violent shock to the gun cotton discs, which in turn explode and impart a shock to the main charge, two hundred pounds of gun cotton. The air chamber is made of the finest compressed steel, or of phosphor bronze, a third of an inch thick. When ready for action, this chamber has to bear a pressure of thirteen hundred and fifty pounds to the square inch. So severe is the compression that in the largest sized torpedoes the air in this chamber weighs no less than sixty-three pounds. The air is forced in by very powerful pumps of a special design. After this chamber is that containing the stop valve and steering gear. The stop valve is a species of air tap, sealing the air chamber until the torpedo is to be discharged. The valve is so arranged that it is impossible to insert the torpedo into the firing tube before the valve has been opened and so brought the air chamber into communication with the starting valve, which does not admit air to the engines till after the projectile has left the tube. The steering apparatus is undoubtedly the most ingenious of the many clever contrivances packed into a whitehead torpedo. Its function is to keep the torpedo on an even keel at a depth determined before the discharge. This is effected by means of two agencies, a swinging weight and a valve which is driven in by water pressure as the torpedo sinks. When the torpedo points head downward, the weight swings forward, and by means of connecting levers brings the horizontal rudders up. As the torpedo rises, the weight becomes vertical and the rudder horizontal. This device only ensures that the torpedo shall travel horizontally. The valve makes it keep its proper depth by working in conjunction with the pendulum. The principle, which is too complicated for full description, is, put briefly, a tendency of the valve to correct the pendulum whenever the latter swings too far. Lest the pendulum should be violently shaken by the discharge, there is a special controlling gear which keeps the rudder fixed until the torpedo has proceeded a certain distance, when the steering mechanism is released. The steering gear does not work directly on the rudder. Mr. White had found in his earlier experiments that the pull exerted by the weight and valve was not sufficient to move the rudders against the pressure of the screws. He therefore introduced a beautiful little auxiliary engine, called the servo motor, which is to the torpedo what the steam steering gear is to a ship. The servo motor, situated in the engine room, is only four inches long, but the power it exerts by means of a compressed air is so great that a pressure of half an ounce exerted by the steering gear produces a pull of 160 pounds on the rudders. The engines consist of three single-action cylinders, their cranks working at an angle of 120 degrees to one another, so that there is no dead or stopping point in their action. They are very small but, thanks to the huge pressure in the air chamber, develop nearly 31 horsepower. Lest they should race, or revolve too quickly, while passing from the tube to the water, and do themselves serious damage, they are provided with a delay action valve, which is opened by the impact of the torpedo against the water. Further, lest the air should be admitted to the cylinders at a very high pressure, gradually decreasing to zero, a reducing valve, or governor, is added, to keep the engines running at a constant speed. Whitehead torpedoes are fired from tubes above or below the water line. 
Deck tubes have the advantage of being more easily aimed, but when loaded they are a source of danger, as any stray bullet or shell from an enemy ship might explode the torpedo with dire results. There is therefore an increasing preference for submerged tubes. An ingenious device is used for aiming the torpedo, which makes allowances for the speed of the ship from which it is fired, the speed of the ship aimed at, and the speed of the torpedo itself. When the moment for firing arrives, the officer in charge presses an electric button, which sets in motion an electric magnet fixed to the side of the tube. The magnet releases a heavy ball which falls and turns the firing rod. Compressed air, or a powder discharge, is brought to bear on the rear end of the torpedo, which, if submerged, darts out from the vessel's side along a guiding bar, from which it is released at both ends simultaneously, thus avoiding the great deflection towards the stern which would occur were a broadside torpedo not held at the nose till the tail is clear. This guiding apparatus enables the torpedo to leave the side of a vessel traveling at high speed, almost at right angles, to the vessel's path. It will be easily understood that a whitehead torpedo is a costly projectile, and that its value, 500 pounds or more, makes the authorities very careful of its welfare. During practice with blank torpedoes, a Holmes light is attached. This light is a canister full of calcium phosphide to which water penetrates through numerous holes, causing gas to be thrown off and rise to the surface, where, on meeting with the oxygen of the air, it bursts into flame, and gives off dense volumes of heavy smoke, disclosing the position of the torpedo by night or day. At Portsmouth, there are storehouses containing upwards of a thousand torpedoes, Every torpedo is at intervals taken to pieces, examined, tested, and put together again after full particulars have been taken down on paper. Each steel baby is kept bright and clean, coated with a thin layer of oil, lest a single spot of brush should mar its beauty. An interesting passage from Lieutenant G. E. Armstrong's book on Torpedoes and Torpedo Vessels will illustrate the scrupulous exactness observed in all things relating to the torpedo depot. As an example of the care with which the stores are kept, it may be mentioned that a particular tiny pattern of brass screw which forms part of the torpedo's mechanism, and which is valued at about tuppence halfpenny per gross, is never allowed to be a single number wrong. On one occasion, when the stock-taking took place, it was found that instead of five thousand little screws being accounted for by the man who was told off to count them, there were only four thousand nine hundred and ninety-seven. Several full-scap letters were written and exchanged over these three small screws, though their value was not more than a small fraction of a farthing. The classic instance of the effectiveness of this type of torpedo is the Battle of the Yalu, fought between the Japanese and Chinese fleets in 1894. The Japanese had been pounding their adversaries for hours with their big guns without producing decisive results. So they determined upon a torpedo attack, which was delivered early in the morning under cover of darkness, and resulted in the destruction of a cruiser, the Ting Yuan. The next night, a second incursion of the Japanese destroyers wrecked another cruiser, the Lai Yen, which sunk within five minutes of being struck, sank the Wai Yen, an old wooden vessel used as a training school, and blew a large steam launch out of the water onto an adjacent wharf. These hits below the belt were too much for the Chinese, who soon afterwards surrendered to their more scientific and better equipped foes. If a general naval war broke out today, most nations would undoubtedly pin their faith to the Whitehead torpedo for use in the open sea, now that its accuracy has been largely increased by the gyroscope, a heavy flywheel attachment revolving rapidly at right angles to the path of the torpedo, and rendering a change of direction almost impossible. For harbor defense, the Brennan, or its American rival, the Sims Edison, might be employed. They are both torpedoes dirigible from a fixed base by means of connecting wires. The presence of these wires constitutes an obstacle to their being of service in a fleet action. The Brennan is used by our naval authorities. It is the invention of a Melbourne watchmaker. Being a comparatively poor man, Mr. Brennan applied to the colonial government for grants to aid him in the manufacture and development of his torpedo, and he was supplied with sufficient money to perfect it. In 1881, he was requested by our Admiralty to bring his invention to England, where it was experimented upon, and pronounced so efficient for harbor and creek defense that at the advice of the Royal Engineers, Mr. Brennan was paid large sums for his patents and services. The Brennan torpedo derives its motive power from a very powerful engine on shore, capable of developing a hundred horsepower, from which it is connected by stout piano wires. One end of these wires is wound on two reels inside the torpedo, each working a screw. The other end is attached to two winding drums driven at high velocity by the engine on shore. As the drums wind in the wire, the reels in the torpedo revolve, 
Consequently, the harder the torpedo is pulled back, the faster it moves forward, like a trained trotting mare. The steering of the torpedo is affected by alterations in the relative speeds of the drums, and consequently of the screws. The drums run loose on the engine axle, and are thrown in or out of gear by means of a friction brake, so that their speed can be regulated without altering the pace of the engines. Any increase in the speed of one drum causes a corresponding decrease in the speed of the other. The torpedo can be steered easily to right or left within an arc of 40 degrees on each side of straight ahead, but when once launched it cannot be retrieved except by means of a boat. Its path is marked by a Holmes light, described above. It has a 200-pound gun cotton charge, and is fitted with an apparatus for maintaining a proper depth very similar to that used in the Whitehead torpedo. The Sims Edison torpedo differs from the Brennan in its greater obedience to orders and in its motive power being electrically transmitted through a single connecting cable. It is over 30 feet in length and 2 feet in diameter. Attached to the torpedo proper by rods is a large copper float furnished with balls to show the operator the path of the torpedo. The torpedo itself is in four parts. The explosive head, the magazine of electric cables, which is paid out as the torpedo travels, the motor room, and the compartment containing the steering gear. The projectile has a high speed and long range, over 4,000 yards. It can twist and turn in any direction, and, if need be, can be called to heel. Like the Brennan, it has the disadvantage of a long trailing wire, which could easily become entangled, and it might be put out of action by any damage inflicted upon the float by the enemy guns but it is likely to prove a very effective harbor guard if brought to the test. In passing to the Orling Armstrong torpedo, we enter the latest phase of torpedo construction. Seeing the disadvantages arising from wires, electricians have sought a means of controlling torpedoes without any tangible connection. Wireless telegraphy showed that such a means was not beyond the bounds of possibility. Mr. Axel Orling, a Swede, working in concert with Mr. J. T. Armstrong, has lately proved that a torpedo can be steered by waves of energy transmitted along rays of light, or perhaps it would be more correct to say, along shafts of a form of X-ray. Mr. Orling claims for his torpedo that it is capable of a speed of 22 knots or more an hour, that it can be called to heel and steered to right or left at will, that as long as it is in sight it is controllable by rays invisible to the enemy, that not merely one, but a number of torpedoes can be directed by the same beams of light, that, as it is submerged, it would, even if detected, be a bad mark for the enemy's guns. The torpedo carries a shaft which projects above the water, and bears on its upper end a white disc to receive the rays and transmit them to internal motors to be transmuted into driving power. The rod also carries at night an electric light, shaded on the enemy's side, but rendering the whereabouts of the torpedo very visible to the steerer. Mr. Orling's torpedo acts throughout in a cruelly calculating manner. Before its attack, a ship would derive small advantage from a crinoline of steel netting, for the large torpedo conceals in its head a smaller torpedo, which, as soon as the netting is struck, darts out and blasts an opening through which its longer brother, after a momentary delay, can easily follow. The netting penetrated, the torpedo has yet to strike twice before exploding. On the first impact, a pin, projecting from the nose, is driven in to reverse the engines, and at the same time a certain nut commences to travel along a screw. The nut having worked its way to the end of the thread, the head of the torpedo fills slowly through a valve, giving it a downward slant in front. The engines are again reversed, and the nut again travels, this time bringing the head of the torpedo up, so as to strike the vessel at a very effective angle from below. This torpedo has passed beyond the experimental stage. It is reported that by command of the Swedish government, to whom Mr. Orling offered his invention, and of the king, who takes a keen interest in the ideas of his young countrymen, a number of experiments were some time ago carried out in the Swedish rivers. Torpedoes were sent two and a half miles, directed as desired, and made to rise or sink, all this without any tangible connection. The government was sufficiently satisfied with the result to take up the patents, as furnishing a cheap means of defending their coasts. Mr. Orling has described what he imagines would happen in case of an attack on a position protected by his ingenious creations. Suppose that I had twelve torpedoes hidden away under ten feet of water in a convenient little cove, and that I was directed to annihilate a hostile fleet just appearing above the horizon. Before me, on a little table perhaps, I would have my apparatus. Twelve buttons would be under my fingers. Against each button there would be a description of the torpedo to which it was connected. It would tell me its power of destruction, and the power of its machinery, and for what distance it would go. On each button, also, 
would be indicated the time that I must press it to release the torpedoes. Well, now, I perceive a large vessel in the van of an approaching fleet. I put my fingers on the button which is connected with my largest and most formidable weapon. I press the button, perhaps for twelve seconds. The torpedo is pushed forward from its fastenings by a special spring. A small pin is extracted from it, and immediately the motive machinery is set in motion, and underneath the water goes my little agent of destruction, and there is nothing to tell the ship of its doom. I place my hand on another button, and according to the time I press it, I steer the torpedo. The rudder answers to the rays, and the rays answer to the will of my mind. If this torpedo acts fully up to its author's expectations, naval warfare, at least as at present conducted, would be impossible. There appears to be no reason why this torpedo should not be worked from shipboard, and we cannot imagine that hostile ships possessing such truly infernal machines would care to approach within miles of one another, especially if the submarine be reinforced by the aerial torpedo, different patterns of which are in course of construction by Mr. Orling and Major Unji, our brother Swede. The Orling type will be worked by the new rays, strong enough to project it through space. Major Unges will depend for its motive power upon a succession of impulses obtained by the ignition of a slow-burning gas passing through a turbine at the rear of the torpedo. The inventor hopes for a range of at least six miles. What defense would be possible against such missiles? Liable to be shattered from below or shivered from above, the warship will be placed at an ever-increasing disadvantage. Its size will only render it an easier mark. Its strength, bought at the expense of weight, will be but the means of ensuring a quicker descent to the sea's bottom. Is it not probable that sea fights will become more and more matters of a few terrible, quickly delivered blows? Human inventions will hold the balance more and more evenly between nations of unequal size, first on sea, then on land, until at last, as we may hope, even the hottest heads and bravest hearts will shrink from courting what will be less war than sheer annihilation, and war, man's worst enemy, will be itself annihilated. End of chapter 8. Recording by Todd.